All God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Well, we are in a, if you're new here, we're in a sermon series. Uh, That's our bumper video for our series. It's in 1 Thessalonians called Gospel Centered Church. And if you're wondering why we have these interesting things on stage, it's just a visual reminder that we are to be gospel centered in every part of our life. So we've had a couple of other scenes up here. We've had school, we've had home. Now we have work and play. We're to be gospel centered everywhere. Uh, and that's where we're going to go in 1 Thessalonians, if you want to turn there in chapter 4. Uh, while you're turning there, I have an announcement. I don't know if you know this or not, but Gary and Kim's son won the Indianapolis 500. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen! Amen. <laughs> oh, it's never going to end now. <laughs> Get to heaven, we're going to talk about it. Yes, sir. We have a typo. How to walk Ephesians 4. Oh, Ephesians. Yeah. It's not Ephesians. So, it's 1 Thessalonians, in case you're wondering. (laughs) No, God's people said? (laughs) Amen. Hey, I am blessed to have a couple of my dearest friends in the world, a couple of couples, uh, who are with us this morning, and they came down from... Uh, the Springfield area. They were part of the last church that I pastored. Uh, Ed and Beth Fuller sitting right over here behind Teresa and Sam and uh, Randy and Annette Stark. Would you guys wave at everybody? We're Thank you for coming down. <clears throat> love, love them so much. Couldn't ask for any better friends in the world. And they came down last night, stayed in a hotel in town just to, just to visit with us. And so we had dinner and they're with worshiping this morning with us this morning. So we're in First Thessalonians, how to walk. You know how to walk. Can you still walk? Not quite the way you used to. A few of you, you know. You know, people pay attention to how you walk. They're watching. When I went to seminary in North Carolina, I I was living in a new environment. Everything was new. And, and, you know, new state, new new area, new everything. I didn't know anybody. I didn't even have a church home. I was trying to find one and uh, see see where God wanted to plant us. And I I met another student in one of my classes in seminary, and he was a, he was a local pastor. Um, since then, we, with another, an unbelievable friend, he's like a brother to me now, he's pastoring in uh, Vermont now, but he was pastoring 30 minutes from campus in North Carolina, and he invited me to church after we met. We had a lot of similarities, things we liked. So he, he invited us to come on a Wednesday night. You know, you can learn a lot about a church if you go on Wednesday night, a lot about how they live out their faith and what they believe, and they can learn a lot about you. So it's my first, our first visit to this church ever was on a Wednesday night. And the church building, like so many Baptist buildings in that area out in the country, was uh, red brick, white columns out front with these solid wooden doors. And if you've been to the southeast, that's what most Baptist churches look like. Uh, and I expected that. What I did not expect was the grand entrance we were about to make. Well, you know, just trying to find the place and getting there and judging the distance, we were running a little bit late. And so we made our way to the front, and when we opened the front doors, those old wooden doors, this church was old, it's beautiful, but it's old, it, they creaked, solid doors creaked. All right? And, and, and inside, so those buildings are long rectangles with two, just two rows of pews. They're pretty good size, but they did, those old buildings also don't have a large foyer. Not, 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 I mean, it's like a 10 by 10 
with a couple of spillover rooms on the sides that used for Sunday school. That's, how, that's just how they look. And, and then there's two more solid doors, and they keep them open. So when you open the back doors, the foyer is so tiny, everybody in the building can see who comes in. So we open these two doors. They're already in Bible study and prayer. It creaks really loud, and you know what everybody in the building does. Who's running late? It, you know, so everybody turned around and looked at us, and we're now looking at them. We've never been here before. We're in the spotlight, and the only guy I know is the pastor who's up front. So trying to not keep the focus on us any more than possible, we just thought we just got to hurry and go in there and sit down because everybody quit looking at us. And so we, we, we just, let, let's just keep moving um, and, and get in there as quick as we could. Well, Jordan, my son, it was five. He couldn't be with us today, um, so I can talk about him. <clears throat> I would anyway, and he wouldn't care. He's five years old. Shiloh, our, our, our second child, was two. So Teresa's carrying Shiloh. Jordan's walking in front of us. We open those big doors, and we just kind of want to hurry him on and just keep rolling. Well, Jordan steps two feet inside the foyer, and he sees something he's never seen in his life in this old church. Red shag carpet. I mean, bright red, fire engine red, shag carpet. So he decides, so he's never seen this in his life, he's five years old, he's going to stop immediately and pet it. <laughs> so he squats down and pets it. Well, we're not paying attention, and we're trying to hurry. Teresa's in, next in line, she's carrying Shiloh. Well, she trips over him and falls into the foyer. Thankfully, it was carpet. Doing everything she can to hold our two-year-old as she tumbles down. And I'm already in momentum. So I trip all over them and just tumble into the sanctuary. That's our first impression. <laughs> of the church I would soon be associate pastor of. <laughs> People pay attention to how you walk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Oh, me. Our, our faith, hey, listen, our faith is not lived out in an ivory tower. You know, you know it, it's lived out on the street level of our lives. And it's a living, practical, everyday life experience that impacts all of our actions and all our, our attitudes. And it's an experience that others are watching. I mean, others see that, what we really believe people look at and they see and the gospel transforms our life let me remind you of the definition of a disciple we've talked about before a disciple is someone who is learning to apply the gospel to every area of their life every area of their life that's that's what a disciple is <clears throat> and, and pe so people say they believe one one thing or another but how, how do they walk how do they walk it out and the bible uses the word walk as a lifestyle that's just the term of the metaphor, I walk it out, I, I walk a certain way means I live out what I believe. So we say we believe something, but, but, but how do we live? If you were put on trial today, would there be any evidence that you're a believer? Well, you and I both know that if we're looking for that evidence, we're not looking for sinlessness because we won't find it, will we? A life without sin, it's not an evidence that we're a believer. It would be evidence that we're God. <laughs> and we know we're not. So that, that's not what, we're, what I'm talking about or what we're looking for. So we're not looking at a perfection. We're looking at a pattern. Not what is the perfection of my life, but what is the pattern of my life? Where, do I hunger to be sinless? Do I, do I work toward that? Let the Holy Spirit work in me to, to, to go in that direction. Is that the hunger of my life? Because as we seek to apply the gospel to our life, what happens is God begins to reveal some things in us, some areas in us that need work, and some things that need removed that are in the way. As you apply the gospel to every area of your life, what happens is, is that you, 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 by the Holy Spirit's conviction, recognize that this part of your life hasn't been submitted to the Lord and needs to be. So because He's Lord of all of your life, and so you, you repent of your pride in that part of your life, any particular sin that he's convicted you of, and then you submit it to him. So he uses it for his glory. In other words, God, my life is yours, so what this part of my life needs to be directed by you, not by me. And, and so as I do that, as I submit to him, then he 
transforms me, changes me, uses it for his glory, and that's what it means to live in holiness. Mildred Erickson wrote one of those seminary textbooks that Sam and I had to study in school on theology, and here's what he says in that textbook. He says, one's moral condition is brought into conformity with one's legal status before God. It is a continuation of what has begun in regeneration when a newness of life was conferred upon and instilled within the believer. So we were, we were declared holy when we gave our life to Christ. And then as we live our life, the Lord conforms us into what we've been made to be. In other words, he makes that a reality. And we need to be committed to God's plan for doing so, for our growth. Now remember, let's back up a second. Remember, God, remember Paul loved this church. He dearly loved this church. And he's, he's, he's proud of them, he's pr- he's, and he said so. And yet at the same time, he, 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 he wants to encourage them and commend them to keep growing. He wants them to finish their growth. Back up and look at verse 4, where Sam started with us last week. Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So he said, you're doing it, but grow. Keep, keep going. Don't stop. Continue to grow. Because as a believer, you're a lifelong disciple. Therefore, that means you're a lifelong learner. You won't be perfected at it, perfect at it, on this side of heaven. So you keep growing till he calls you home. And so he says that in verse 4. And then the rest of the letter, basically, is a series of explanations and applications about how to live that out, how we live out what we believe. And some areas get a brief note, like a word or two, and others get a little more lengthier discussion. Uh, you know, last week, we looked at one of those lengthier ones on sexual purity, and Sam did a powerful, marvelous job dealing with that difficult passage. And, and Paul spends a lot more time in Thessalonians on that subject matter because it was a real issue in their culture. It was something they really struggled with, a big thing they struggled with. And it is the same in our culture. Well, now we're going to step into the next ones. And these are smaller. In fact, one of them, a couple of them is only going to have a word or two. But nevertheless, we're going to dig into them and look at it. So let's look at it beginning in verse 9 of chapter 4. And um, I just invite you once again to stand in honor of God's word. Let's read this together. <clears throat> now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Father, we thank you for your word, our powerful time of worship today, Lord, Uh, not to, to get any recognition of our own, but Lord, to recognize you and God, thank you for our leaders helping us do that today. We do love you, but not near enough. We want to love you more because you loved us first. So open our hearts and minds to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's there's four of them here. We just dealt with one last week, so that'd make five total by by the end of the day that we've covered. So it took a whole message to get through one of them, and here we're going to get four more. So let's dig in and look at them. Here's the first one. Gospel-centered churches love one another. Now, as Paul encourages them to keep growing, remember, he is also describing what a gospel-centered church looks like. So he he encourages them to live this way. We also find what that means and that we, we want to follow suit and look that way too. And the first thing he talks about in this text, beginning of verse 9, it'd be the second on the list, is that a gospel-centered church loves one another. Well, indeed, scripturally, it is the first and foremost description of a follower of Christ. So if you take all of Scripture, you'll find that it's actually first on the list. It wasn't the first one he dealt with here because of their context, but it's the first in the Bible we deal with. John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. He said, The world will know whether you're a follower of me or not by this. And then John says in 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 
Now let me remind you, love, we, we studied First John. Love is not God, but God is love. Love is God's nature. It's not just an expression. It's not just something He shows it and, and reveals to us. It's not even just one of His attributes. It's who He is. It's part of His essence. God can never be separated from love. I like the way Peter Kreese says it. He says, God cannot fall in love. He is love. God cannot fall in love for the same reason water can't get wet. It is wet. God is love in eternal action. And so when we are born again, what happens is God, by the Holy Spirit, pours His nature into us. Now, we don't become God, but we have, parts, we have, we, we have part of the nature of God in us because God lives in us and expresses Himself through us. So if God is love and that's His nature, and the Holy Spirit, who is one person of the Trinity, comes and live, it lives in us, then God's nature of love lives in us and is to be expressed through us. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. That's why it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. In fact, in Galatians 5, it's the first one on the list. Paul's saying, <clears throat> now, what does he say here? He says, I don't have an urgent need. Wasn't the first one that I talked about. I don't have an urgent need to teach you this because you already know it. That's what he's getting at. It's not that you can't grow in it. That's what he's telling them they need to do. He, he's saying, I just don't have to teach you. There's not urgent to tell you what love is because you know it. Why do you know it? Because the Holy Spirit has come to live in you if you're a believer and His nature is love, so it's already in you. So the power source and the teaching source of love are already in you. Here's the way Warren Wiersbe says it. Fish do not attend classes to learn how to swim. Birds by nature put out their wings and flap them in order to fly. It is, he says, it is nature that determines actions. Because the Christian has God's nature, he loves because God is love. Nature determines actions. I expect lost people to act how? Lost. Why? Because it's their nature. And Christians are to act how? Hmm. Saved. (laughs) That's right. To act like the Lord. Why? Because our nature's been changed. He is now in us. Now, does that mean we're perfect at it? No. I mean, when fish and birds first start learning to swim and to fly, they're not perfect at it. They grow into their nature. So the, the more they grow, the more perfect at it they become, or the, or the better they are at practicing it. It's the same with us. We've been given a new nature. In this case, it, one, of the, one of those things is love. And we're not perfect at it, but we're to grow in it. And we don't ever accomplish it completely. In other words, you never get to the place in your life where you check this one off your list. Do you know why? Because loving like God by His nature means always putting others first and you and I are always tempted to put ourselves first. Always. So we're never going to be completely perfect at it so that we can check it off the list. It's a lifelong pursuit, something we're always going to look at. And it needs to extend beyond our comfort zones. God sure extended His love beyond His comfort zone. Look at the cross. Do we love those we don't like? That's beyond our comfort zone. And yet he tells us to do so. Are we loving those who wrong us? And he tells us to do so. And if you've been born of God, then you know God. Therefore, you are capable of producing the love of God. Doesn't mean you're perfect at it, but you can be commanded to do it because now the Holy Spirit is in you. Unbelievers can't. They can't love like God. They may hit on it once in a while, but they can't live a lifestyle of it because this nature, God's nature is, is that love is not in them, but it's in you. So what does the pattern look like? Not the perfection, but the pattern. And when others see our church, do they see a church that's characterized by that kind of love? How, how quickly do people exit the building when the services are over? I love that at Twin Lakes, it's not very soon. I'm serious, I love that. It takes a while for us to get out of here. Do you know why? Because people who love one another want to be together. They don't want to separate. I love that. When someone's struggling or they have a need, how quickly do others respond? You know what I love about Twin Lakes? Is that when someone has a need, usually it's met even before Sam and I hear about it. 
because somebody else in here heard about it and took care of it. And I hear that over and over. I mean, are we perfect, perfect, perfect at it? No. Is, and, and so that's not what I'm getting at. Somebody may sit here and say, I've got a hurt. Well, you know, please be sure you express it. And I tell you what, this is a loving place. I've been here long enough. Be a year next week. Be a year next week. <clears throat> been here long enough to see it. Long enough to see it. So someone has said a church might have all the necessary ingredients to do church, but if it lacks love, it's not being the church. I like coffee. Probably too much. My grandmother, who's now with the Lord, she used to drink iced coffee when I was little. But she'd drink hot coffee in the morning, and then she'd drink iced coffee all day. Long before Starbucks ever discovered it, <laughs> Nanny already drank it. <clears throat> That's what I should. And I tasted it, and it wasn't bad, but it ain't my thing. I want mine piping hot. Piping, piping hot. Thank God for Yeti tumblers. And even on my desk, I got a, thir- I got a coffee warmer, so when I'm drinking out of my precious Razorback cup, and all God's people said... <clears throat> When I'm drinking out of that Razorback cup, it stays hot because I set it on that coffee warm. I like it hot. I hate lukewarm coffee. I mean, that's nasty. That's just about as nasty as a lukewarm Coke. <clears throat> Yuck. They drink lukewarm Coke in Eastern Europe. I've been on mission there. It's like, that's nasty. <clears throat> you remember what Jesus told the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2? He told them they were what? Lukewarm, remember that? He said, Jesus said, I know your works. They, 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 he said, you've got everything together for the model church. and for, Everything's there for doing church. You've got, he said, you've got sound doctrine. You've got superb morality. You're patient in suffering. You're the model church, right? Whoa, but wait. He said, there's something missing. And I've got a big problem with it, Jesus said. I've got to get a huge problem. Remember what he said they were missing? You have left something. What'd they leave? Their first love. What do you mean by that? It means, by definition, it means the love you had at first. So what's he talking about? He's talking about their, the love of your conversion. In other words, the love you have for God because He loved you first, and therefore because you, have, you love God, knowing His love that's now in you, you love one another. He said that's what you've left. I mean, that's the first and second commandment. Love God and love others. And they cannot be separated. So anytime we try to separate them or not do one or the other, here's what Jesus says about us. He said, you are yuck. He said, because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You're yucky to me when you don't do that. So therefore, repent. Which he got a little more serious than that. So if you don't repent, I'm going to, take your light. I'm going to put out your light. Ouch. What that meant is, he says, then I'm not going to work in your church no more. I'm going to remove my lampstand from your church and I won't be at work there no more. So, hey folks, let's not lose our first love. Amen? Let's not lose it. Let's grow it. And that's what Paul is saying. Grow it. Then he moves to the second one. Here's where he just hits a couple of phrases, so let's dig into them a little bit. He said in the end of verse 10, do this more and more. In verse 11 he says, and to aspire to live quietly. Gospel-centered churches lead quiet lives. What? What? Come and get quiet lives? How is that possible? And how's Brother Sam ever going to pass that test? <laughs> Come think of it, how am I going to pass that test? <laughs> quiet lives. I mean, does this mean you got to wear, you know, special robes and covenant to silence all day? Because some of you is in big trouble. Don't elbow, don't elbow your spouse. You know, sometimes being quiet is important, sometimes it's dangerous. I was reading about a couple who, who were uh, traveling in their car together to go to watch, go watch a movie, and the husband was sitting there in silence smiling. Dude, you know she's watching you. If you're sitting there quiet smiling, you know what's running through her head? Forty zillion things. You know the difference between a, a woman's mind and a, and a man's mind, right? <clears throat> it's like a woman's mind is like, it's like, my, it's like your iPhone, you know? It's, got a, I mean, it's able to process a zillion things at once, you know? It's got, take Teresa's phone, for example, and you, if you open up her Safari with just her Internet app, there'll be 45 Internet openings. 
and she can concentrate on all of them. And buddy, you know what your mind's like? An old typewriter. And it's really hard to go back in the race sometimes too, isn't it? <laughs> so he's sitting there quiet, and she's, so she's going to ask a question. Because he's smiling, and she asked this question. Why are you so quiet? Why, what are you thinking? Oh, my word, when a woman asks you what you're thinking, you're in trouble. No matter how you answer, you're going to lose. Amen? <laughs> so, he said what he was thinking. He said, I was just thinking about how critical you are. Now remember, he's a typewriter. And, and, and she's a you know, new computer. So she, hmm, that kind of irritated. She got thinking about it in 40, different, 40 million different ways. And, but then she thought, you know, my husband's a godly man, so I'm, I'm just going to ask, what do you mean by that? So she said, what do you mean by that, that I'm critical? He said, hmm, here's what he said. He said, I mean, our family couldn't exist without you. You were so critical to me. And everybody said, oh. Say, say it with me. Everybody said, oh. He, that's seriously what he was thinking. So when Paul says, you're to lead, you're, you're, you're to lead quiet lives, what, what in the world is he talking about? Well, <clears throat> the Greek word... Philotomeomai means to be zealous or to strive eagerly. So what he's saying is, strive with all your might to be quiet. And some of you, just let's just move on to the next one. <laughs> but he's not talking about verbal speech. He's talking about disposition. It doesn't have anything to do with our verbal speech. It has to do with our character, our attitude. Here's what it literally means. It means the avoidance of agitation and restless pursuits of things that don't line up with God's priorities. Let me say that again. Here's what it means. Here's the definition. The definition is the avoidance of agitation and restless pursuits of things that don't line up with Christ's priorities. It means gospel-centered churches are characterized by people who have a restful, peaceful trust in the Lord. A restful, peaceful trust in Him. They, they, they know that every moment and every event is an opportunity for the Lord to be glorified, to do something. And they trust Him in that. Do you ever notice Jesus was never late and never in a hurry? Do you remember the story of Jairus' daughter? Jairus' daughter is really sick, and Father wants him to come quickly to heal her. Time is of the essence, <clears throat> so there's a schedule to keep, and he begins making their his way there, although he already knows what's going on and he's on his way to a resurrection party. But there was another woman along the way who had an issue of blood. You remember that? She had a blood disease, a, a, a rare and painful blood disease. And because of the nature of this blood disease, she, she just didn't want to be in the spotlight, so she thought, if I just touch the hem of his garment. In fact, we heard, you heard a little bit of that story in the video testimony last week about how a pastor shared that and really touched that woman's life. So he, she goes along and she touches his garment, and when she does, she's healed. What's Jesus do? Time is of the essence. We've got to get to a resurrection party. He stopped. Why? Because Jesus knew immediately this is a moment for God to be glorified. We're always in a hurry. Sometimes we're so ambitious to get our goals accomplished and our, ta and our tasks done that we even unintentionally brush people aside in order to get there without realizing even what we're doing. But, but Jesus isn't like that. He pursued the will of God patiently and restfully. And I did say that, restfully. He worked hard and he rested on purpose. It's the characteristic of Christ that we need to work on. What does it mean? <clears throat> It means I don't take advantage of others. I trust God for my needs. It means I don't cut corners on what I want. I patiently wait on the Lord. It means I don't get rattled when things aren't working the way I want them to. I trust the Lord. It means I don't draw attention to myself, but work to see others honored so that God is glorified. To aspire to live quietly and... 
to mind your own affairs. Gospel-centered churches mind their own business. Well, now we've went from bad to worse. <laughs> well, actually, this is a natural progressive step of what we just talked about. Because if, if, listen, if we are living a quiet life, then we're minding our own business. The first one leads to the second one. So what's going on here, what Paul is addressing is, instead of doing their own work, some church members were meddling, meddling in the affairs of others. Theologian Mark House says, Nothing's more disruptive to the unity of a church than a noisy individual who desires to, who desires to know every detail about another person's life. And few things present a more distorted view of the Christian faith than a group of Christians who make it their business to get in everybody else's business. Ouch! <laughs> you know what saddens me? Is that too much of the lost world sees the church as a bunch of people who sit around and gossip about everybody else's business. And so when Paul says this, he, listen, let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that we don't help bear one another's burdens or carry the loads. He's not saying we don't hold one another accountable. And he's not saying we, that we don't work to make our community and our nation better. He's not saying we don't, that's, that, that we don't get involved in those things. In fact, if we're good Christian citizens, we will work to make our community better. So that, that's not what he's saying. What, what is he saying? What he's saying is, is we, we, what he's talking about is, don't be a busybody in the affairs that are none of your concern. If they're of the Lord's concern, yes. And if they are your concern, yes. But if they happen to do anything with your concern, what he's saying is, stay in your lane. So, so it's like the subcontractors that are building my house. You know, I, 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 I've yet to see the guys who are putting the flooring in walk outside and look at the roofers and go, you know what, I wouldn't start that way. <laughs> they stay in their lane. Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> so, I mean, that's what he's talking about here. You, you don't have to tell everybody how to do their business. In other words, those who are working in the nursery don't need to come and tell the choir how to sing. Hello? <laughs> You get what I've got. You, 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 you with me? Yeah. Paul says, let's talk about another one. Gospel-centered churches work with their hands. Working with your hands as we instructed you so that we may walk properly before outsiders. Gospel-centered churches work with their hands. Do you know if you Google declining work ethics on the Internet, you will come up with over 9 million results on declining work ethics? Let, let me share some thoughts from an article that I read when I googled that. Here was the article title, Why America Doesn't Work. How the decline of the worth at work ethic, this is the subtitle, how the decline of the worth ethic is hurting your family and your future and what can you do? That was the article title. Here's an excerpt. <clears throat> the authors are clearly worried about the future of America which looks bleak with soaring crime rates, moral de decay, declining productivity, skyrocketing costs of social programs, and gigantic debt, and a loss of competitive position in the world. They are concerned to show that the very thing that made America great is in trouble today. Our economic engine is running down. We are losing our work ethic. And in their examination, they conclude that Americans aren't working much and they aren't working well. The root of the matter that they say as to what's happened is, here's what they say, the once prevalent Christian understanding of work has been a significant contributor to America's success. But as the strength and pervasiveness of Christian belief wanes, so does the commitment to work. A weakening work ethic is obvious. Its diminishment is recounted in a number of anecdotes, much of which they blame and lay at the feet of the 1960s. The greatest cultural and social revolution in American history. This was the period, they, they go on to say, that largely destroyed the mainstream's acceptance of transcendent truths. An attack on work was part of that universalistic rejection. And so, with no transcendent values and no goal other than the pleasure of work for work's sake, traditional restraints on behavior collapsed. Thus was born a new breed of predators who exploited everything for their own advantage, making exceptions for themselves instead of playing by the rules. 
That was written in 1991. Wow. Paul says, how you walk as a believer, how you walk with God is a witness to the world around us. Your work matters to God. All of your work. A disciple is someone who's learning to apply the gospel to every area of their life. Every, every area of your life. So for the Christian, there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. Everything is sacred. Every part of my life belongs to God and everything I'm involved in. Everything. When we think about witnessing, we often think about our words and our words are important. How could someone know how to accept Christ as Savior and Lord but unless we tell them? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God and how will they hear if no one shares? Yet at the same time, one of the greatest testimonies we have to what we share is the commitment to how we live out what we believe. A life of integrity, commitment, and hard work, and yes, intentional rest is what others will see, or the lack thereof. Laziness and taking advantage of others doesn't have any place among the Christian faith. Ron Hutchcraft was asked once, or he asked once, uh, a woman in his church what she did for a living. What do, you, what do you do for a living? <laughs> Here's what she said. She said, Pastor, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, cleverly disguised as a machine operator. Everything belongs to Him for the believer. Everything is an opportunity to be gospel-centered. To express the gospel, to live out the gospel, to show the gospel, to share the gospel. Everything. Everything. Everything in our life is to be gospel centered. How we live matters, and you are being watched. <clears throat> so, can others see Jesus in you? Can they see him in our church? How are you walking? How are you walking? Let's bow our heads this morning. I confess to you <clears throat> that I am not walking perfectly. I know I'm not. I was so grateful for a time of praise and song this morning. Just continued to remind me of that and to remind me of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for my sins that are ever before me and Satan constantly accuses me of. It also reminded me of the hunger that I, I, I have and want to grow in to be more like Him and to see my life rid of some of those things. So as you think this morning about what the Lord has spoken to you by His Holy Spirit through His Word, what does He want to talk to you about? What is He talking to you about? What, what area does He say, hey, this needs some work. This needs surrendered. It, and it might be from last week still. Some of us are still working on last week, and because of our sermon-based studies, I'm thankful we have, we... We're able to keep doing that, kind of take that to the next level. So it may be there. Maybe one of these other four things that Paul has shared with us this morning or some sub point, most likely, of those areas because there's a bunch of, bunch, of, bunch of things here. Well, just surrender. What, what does it mean to apply the gospel? Let me tell you one more time, then, then we'll spend some time in prayer. To apply the gospel to that thing, that area that he may be convicting you of, that you're not doing right or that you are doing wrong um, or that you need to pick up, to apply the gospel that, to that means that you confess your pride to the Lord, any specific sin in there, in that area that he is convicting you of that you need to ask his forgiveness for. And yes, he says... If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because you, you're never going to earn that forgiveness. It's a gift. But you have to want it. And He knows if you do. So I ask His forgiveness. And then, 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 as you apply the gospel, submit it to Him. Say, Lord, I can't do this without you. I'll never get this right without you. I just, I can't. 
See, that's part of that repentance is recognizing you need Him. You need Him in this. So Lord, I want to submit this thing to You. I need Your work in it. I need You to change me. I need You to work through me. I I need You to take this over. So I want to work this out in my relationship with You. And I I don't want this to be the last time we talk about it. I, I need to grow here. So bring this back to my attention. Change me. Change me. Father, I thank You so much for Your for your Son, Jesus, who makes what we just talked about possible. It's the only way it is. I'm so thankful we can be forgiven of our sins. And I am so thankful, Lord, that because of You, we can grow. We can grow in Your likeness. We can be more like You. Father, as we consider these things from your word that you have shared with us today lord we submit these things to you lord hear our prayers as we bring these individual things to you in our lives in our homes and we ask by your holy spirit that you would convince us of what is true and what is right convict us of what is wrong and then convert us lord change us conform us into the image of your son jesus christ Help us to grow. Then, Lord, before I close, I'm mindful there's someone here in this room or someone listening online who who can't do that because they can't grow in anything they don't have. Your nature's not in them. And so I pray, Father, that they would recognize in this moment that if they do not have a relationship with You, then all they need to do is to accept the Gospel to ask for your forgiveness of sin, to trust in what Jesus did on a cross for us and declare that to you, that they trust you by faith. They want forgiveness and they want to follow you. They want you to change their life. Lord, it's a choice. And it's a a simple choice and it's a difficult choice. The difficulty, Lord, as you know, is to submit the pride to you. But the simplicity is there's no extra work to do to get there. We accept what you've already given us. If someone needs to do that right now, I pray, Lord, that would be the heart of their prayer. And there's no special words necessarily, Lord. It's a decision of the heart. So you may have just prayed the words I just said. God, I thank you for this church. Just as Paul did in Thessalonica, to, Lord, I'm, I am so thankful for what I am blessed to be part of and to witness here. Thank you, God, for your character and the gospel being the center of Twin Lakes Baptist Church. And, but I pray, Lord, it would grow. Help us to grow. God, help us to continue to grow. And not so that we might be prideful and compare ourselves to others, but, Lord, only compare ourselves to you and to just do that because, Lord, we love you and that we do that because you first loved us. In Jesus' precious, precious holy name we pray. Amen.